morning and Councilman Gil Schistler from Temple Terrace and uh, uh, Director Marvin Knight. Uh, where, now oh, there you are, hi. Um, good morning. And let's, uh, let's have a little hand for the uh,
and we must get better funding. <laughs> investment in the recovery from the pandemic must include investment in public transit. We are right now working with local partners to secure federal grants for our first electric buses and for rebuilding our heavy maintenance facility. And let's all keep our fingers crossed that all of that falls into place. We are also optimistic that the passing of President Biden's Build Back Better agenda will provide historic investments in public transit. But we cannot rely on federal investment alone. Local financial support strategies are crucial to moving our projects along and delivering on our community's expectations for a robust transportation system. We stand at a turning point of great challenges and great opportunities. Although part is now woefully underfunded, I'm optimistic about our future. I'm optimistic because I can feel our community understanding the need for transit and frankly demanding better transit options. And I can feel our community pulling together to sensibly plan and fund our transportation future. I'm very excited to be working with all of you toward the future of robust, sustainable transit throughout our community. And thank you all for being here today and being a partner, each and every one of you, in heart and our, our transportation future. Thank you. And now I'll bring up our next speaker, Ms. Nikki Brenning of the Nikki Consultant Team. Thank you so much. Good morning, Heart. Good morning. Good morning, Heart. Good morning. Let's get excited about transit. I'm excited about transit, so I'm very, very excited to be here today. Um, I'm really glad to be here today because of the leader that you have, Miss Adelie LeGrand. I've known her for several years, watched her career grow, and I just like to say I'm so proud of you and the leadership that you are exhibiting here at Heart. And I look forward to all the great things that you're going to do. I've been in transit 21 years, started my career in the marketing department at Lynx in Orlando. And I can tell you for the last 21 years, I've worked all over this country with all types of transit agencies. And I've never seen a board so excited about a new leader. And so you're lucky. I hope you're able to keep this excitement from your board. Up the name tags falling off, I'm so excited. I hope you're able to keep this excitement from your board and from your staff because there's only great things that can happen with a lead with a leadership team like the Heart Board and the leadership team that Ms. LeGrand is building. So let's give her and the Heart Board another round. Of now before we get started, I need to do a little bit of housekeeping. There are two things that we really need to know while we're here. We need to know where the exits are. There's one behind you, there's one to my right, there's one behind me to my left. If something happens, run. <laughs> run to those exits. The second is the most important, where are the restrooms? They are right outside the door here. You saw them when you came in. If you gotta go, just throw up your church finger and head to the restroom. Um, before I bring up our esteemed panel and the folks that are gonna talk to you today, I want to make some um, recognition. I want to recognize people who are absolutely the heart of heart. And those are the people who are on the front lines every day, who are the face of the organization. And the people that I'm about to recognize have over 182 years combined of working at heart. That's longer than all of us have been alive. But they have been the frontline workers at heart making sure people get to the most important places they need to go. That's work, that's medical appointments, that's school, that's to the grocery store, that's entertainment venues, 
and that's everywhere that they want to go. So without further ado, when I call your name, please stand and let's not hold the applause to the end. Let's make sure that these individuals know how much we appreciate the work that they do every single day. First is Patrick McKeon, who is a bus operator with 40 years at heart.
day that starts out below 60 degrees here, so we're very, very fortunate. And uh, also looking at this particular building that we're in is just one of many examples of the success that we've realized here in the city of Tampa, Hillsborough County, and the entire Tampa Bay area. As, as you have heard from the previous speakers, public transportation connects people with possibilities. It takes individuals to work, to the doctor's office, to school, uh, to cultural events, to wherever they need to be. So it is critically, critically important that we have a robust and reliable transportation system. Now, as I mentioned, we've been very successful here in, in our community. Not only have we deserved, although after yesterday's game, uh, deserved the, <laughs> the title of Champ of Bay, uh, we also are growing dramatically as a, a region. And you can see that in any of the, the uh, surveys that you see, we are always in top 10, the fastest growing city, uh, best tech city, best place to start a small business, best place to grow a business, best place to do just about everything. So we are very, very fortunate to be in this community. But with that said, our success also brings with it some issues. And one of the things that we're looking at in Transforming Tampa's Tomorrow are those issues that need to be improved as we continue to grow. And for me, three of those are the ones that are really intertwined. And that is providing housing for everyone. Housing that is affordable in our community, in neighborhoods where people want to live. Providing skilled, high-paying jobs and the training that's necessary to get those jobs. That will allow individuals to afford those homes where they want to live. And lastly is the transportation element. We have to provide that transportation that can get individuals to those jobs and provide transportation that will allow people to take cars off of their budget plate and all of the maintenance and everything else associated with it and put that towards housing or towards other issues that, that they need to address. So transportation is critically, critically important. Not only do we have to provide it, but here in the South, we also have to change the culture. You guys have all heard me say that mass transit in the South is more than two people in an SUV. So we've got to make sure that we are getting people out of their cars and they feel comfortable in mass transit because it is robust and reliable. And those are two issues that we have to work on. And public transit is an economic driver as well. Because for every dollar spent on that, you've got $5 in an economic return. So it's good business for our community. And it is a very exciting time here in Tampa. But we also have to look as we grow, we have to look at our environment and the impact that we're leaving. If we can take people out of their cars, put them in public transit, put them in electric buses, look at the reduction that we are, are making in our carbon footprint here in our community. Sustainability and resiliency is key to our survival, frankly. And it's not just the environment, it's our neighborhoods too. And one of the elements of that sustainability and that resiliency is providing those transportation options and also making sure that people are willing to take that and they want to be involved. So I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody that makes hard go each and every day. You guys, I'm the crazy one waving to you in the, as you're driving your bus down the street. You're thinking, who is that crazy woman? That would be me. But I thank you, thank you um, for all that you do to make our city move. And I know it's not just the bus drivers, it's everybody behind the scenes that are making everything look so seamless. So thank you for what you do. Also, to Adley LeGrand, uh, when we were interviewing as a board, we were interviewing the potential uh, CEO candidates. Um, I must admit that I had voted for uh, Adley as the number one, number two, and number three choice. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And that, honestly, there was nobody on that list that held a candle. And since her arrival, she has surpassed any expectations that I personally had. Our heart system does a lot with very, very little. One of the most underfunded systems in the United States. And that's why we have to make sure that we continue to have that partnership, not only with FDOT, but with uh, the Department of Transportation on the federal level. And that we're getting that infrastructure, those infrastructure dollars in here to our community so we can provide those transit options that our community needs. And for us, first and foremost in the city is the extension of the streetcar down, uh, down here throughout our city. So thank you to everybody that's making uh, Heart go. I absolutely love the mission. Heart takes people to places that enhance their lives. You can't sum it up any better than that. So thank you to everyone who makes that happen, and thank you to Abby for your incredible leadership. Now, before you clap, I don't think Marvin Knight was recognized as one of our board members. He's Did you? All right, now you recognize him. <laughs> has become a premier provider of sustainable real estate and community solutions in mature and emerging markets across the United States and more recently internationally. I could speak um, personally about some of the changes that he's made in Atlanta, but I'll leave that up to him. Mr. Perry, you have the mic, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Um, you know, there is a challenge here that I have. Um, I went to the funeral of a friend of mine recently. And as is always the case when you go to a funeral, it causes you to reflect on your own life and what people would say um, at your funeral. And let you do a little bit of soul search. But I tell you, after the introductions this morning and the love that Adam and God, I'm going to go back to my company and see how they feel about it. <laughs> and I'm sure they don't feel about it quite the way you feel about her. <laughs> so, thank you again and good morning. And look, um, this is, I have a lot of admiration for her. She's a star, but she's also a taskmaster. And so, I was given by Adelaide and Shanita, a bunch of material that I needed to read in preparation for this. Fourth, I think I got the mobility plan, the resiliency plan, the state of the region report, and a profile on heart. And they said, make sure you read this before you speak to the folks. So I did. I felt like I was coming for an exam. It didn't bring back good memories. Um, but Notwithstanding the reading, and I did read those materials, I wouldn't dare try to suggest that I have any particular knowledge of, or deep knowledge of Hillsborough County or Tampa. So I'm not gonna tread into those waters, but the material did give me some insight into the ambitious plans that you are pursuing here. So, I wanna commend you on that composite vision for the community, but I also, want to do a couple of things. And this is what I'll do as my charge up here. I want to offer my perspective on the context in which the work that you're doing has to be implemented or is being implemented. Whether you acknowledge it or not, it will hit you if you're not prepared for it. And discuss how community development and transformation forces us all to deal with the tough issues, especially the issues of race and class, that are always on the surface waiting to come up to the surface. And those are the ones that create the difficulty around the work which you're trying to do. And the mayor spoke to a lot of those issues by implication in her remarks. And then I want to mention some of the lessons learned. And I've been at this work for about 40 years, 29 years in Interval, and about 13 years before 
and maybe we can have some Q and A. So if you have any questions, uh, then this is what I was told to do. I was told I have 15 to 20 minutes. That may be too long, so I'll try and shorten it um, as I go. So there is an opportunity at the table right now. I have a modest podcast entitled "Create the Village," and in April of 2020, I had a session, an episode called Has Infrastructure Week Finally Arrived? Seemed like a relevant question at the time. And if you think back to April 2020, we were in the middle of COVID. We thought it would be a two to three week, maybe one month nuisance that would be behind us and we'll get back to normal. Uh, as a nation, we were rolling into a national election. And we were facing what seemed like an imminent passage of a massive infrastructure bill. Seemed like we were right there. But a lot of procrastinating, a lot of internal fighting and different dynamics. But now, 18 months later, we are here. And you look back, and it seemed like a lifetime ago, and so much has happened to our internal politics, our international standing, and a lot of issues. But the good news is, after all those years of missteps, we did pass this bill. And this is important, and I'm going to get to why I want to spend a little bit of time on that. The good news is, we have signed a bill into law. The president did. And so now that's in place. But I want to go back a little bit before that because it's always about infrastructure. So if you think about the 30s and the 40s, the New Deal ushered in a lot of investment, a lot of investment in affordable housing, a lot of investment in all the things that we take for granted today. And then we followed that up in the 50s with investments in the interstate system. And I'm embarrassed to say that during that 25-year period, a very focused period of investment, that's what actually moved the country to be the powerhouse in the 20th century. But we have done very little since then. We're actually still riding on the tailwind of those investments. If you look back, you can't really find the time that we're focused the way we should on making investments in ourselves. And you can see around the world, our competitors are making investments at home, and some smartly are making investments in other countries in exchange for decisions that will lead to their future development for decades. And at the federal level, national level, we've been largely asleep in making some of those critical investments. But, again, not to pour cold water on it, at least we did just, just do something ground. Now, in, I think it was his first inauguration speech, Franklin Roosevelt, he sort of paraphrased Thoreau and challenged people to Fear nothing but fear itself. He called on people to jump headlong into all of their anxieties, uncertainties, and so on. And he asked the country, specifically Congress, to invest in the American worker, the American people, and the idea of America. And so, as I said, it's undeniable that from that time for the next two and a half decades, that's where the America we talk about today really took place. Those who went the investments were made. And 90 years later, we're just as uncomfortable as, and uncertain as we were back then. But with the bill that the mayor spoke to that just got signed into law, there's a lot of opportunity on the table. And I want to harken back to something very similar that happened about 30 years ago. Because in this bill, 
there's, I think there's about $90 billion that is directed to this transit. And 39 or 40 billion of that is for retooling, retrofitting, and investing in existing systems, modernizing existing systems. But what's probably most critical in that bill is about 20% of the $550 billion that's dedicated to its transit, which by the way, has the bill being labeled as the largest investment largest federal investment in public transit in history. About 20% of those dollars are to be awarded, not by the traditional point system, but to a competitive process, to those agencies that come up with creative ways to improve and invest and expand and grow their transit systems. And to me, that's really the opportunity you have. So instead of somebody checking a box and saying this much goes here, this, this much goes here, this much goes there, you have a chance to think and think big and put competitive proposals on the table and I would challenge you not to limit that vision. Um, the third year ago scenario that I want to draw a parallel to and it's something I had first-hand knowledge and then, you know, they say, if you're a carpenter and you have a problem, no matter what the problem is, the answer somehow involves a hammer and a nail, because that's what you know. Well, I will speak to something I do know. And about 30 years ago, the federal government had a program called URD, U-R-D, Urban Revitalization Demonstration Program. And it was and offer invitation to cities to come up with creative ways to address or solve its housing crisis. And the housing crisis in particular that was the focus of that was transformation of public housing. And it was in the Clinton administration and Henry Cisneros was the secretary of HUD at the time. And cities had a chance to innovate propose whatever they thought, they could get way outside the box, and they could propose something radical, and many of them did. I will tell you, most cities proposed putting lipstick on the paper. They were gonna break up some buildings and do some nice little architectural improvements and some green space and so on, but the underlying dynamics were left the same. A few cities got way out there, and one of the early outliers was Atlanta. And that's where I was. And we happened to have been, at the time, Interpol was about a year and a half old, when the Atlanta Housing Authority put out a request for proposals for a development firm to help them figure out what to do with some of their public housing. And they had a particular site, which was site of the country's first public housing project, built on the New Deal and dedicated by Roosevelt in 1936 to usher in public housing in this country. And we responded, and our response was simple. There were five respondents. Four of the respondents to that RFP proposed lipstick on the paper. And we said 1,100 public housing units on 60 acres of land, tear it all down. Bad sociology. 1,100 units, average household income, $4,300 a year. Atlanta was the second poorest city in the United States for any city with a population of 200,000 or more. It was the number one most violent city in America. And that address was the most violent address in that most violent city. And we were destroying young people at 100 miles an hour and didn't bat an eye. And I was thinking back to my life as a kid. And I'm number nine of 11 kids. My household income in Antigua, my family, 
made about $2,500 EC, Eastern Caribbean dollars a year, which is about $1,000 US. I was not poor. Didn't know I was economically poor until I came to this country. But I got the best education you could get back then in the Antigua of those days. It's not the same today. And nobody told me I never was anything, am nothing, and will be anything. Quite the contrary. And there were certain expectations. And the reality is, I thought we were destroying too many people. And particularly, and here is the thing I learned. In that Antigua, poverty was not a crime. Poverty was not a crime. Everybody was poor. We were all in a band of that. Nobody was here and nobody was here. It was like that. Everybody had a shared vision of doing what was right for their kids. And I grew up in what I call the proverbial African village. It takes a village to raise a child. And so I thought, how ironic is it that in the industrialized, more developed countries in the world, poverty is a crime. And the punishment for that crime, especially if you're black or brown, is you're going to be sentenced to the worst educational options, the worst living environment, and your trajectory is going to be set like this before you even come out the world. So our proposal was tear it all down, create a mixed income community, built around great school, early childhood education, health, wellness, recreation, all the things that people who have choice take for granted. And the mayor talked about affordable housing. I would challenge you to think about affordable housing not as the problem we're trying to solve. The problem really is housing affordability in communities where people with choice would choose to live. Because if you found the most undesirable property anywhere, the least accessible property anywhere, and built all your low-cost housing units you possibly could, I would argue not only would you not have solved the problem, you would have aggravated the problem. So the, the challenge is to build housing affordability for all in communities where people with choice would want to live. Because if you're just creating affordable housing in the hell, because we're good at creating heavens and hells, then all you're doing is creating tomorrow's problems today. So we responded, we got selected, and it was like, oh my goodness, now we have to put our money in our mountains. We didn't have much money anyway. But didn't know what we were doing, we made it up. And we created, just in trying to solve that problem or implement that problem, we created a legal, regulatory, and financial model to do holistic community revitalization. And it's now, as Henry Sistero said at our 25th anniversary, there are 250 plus communities across this country that are using the model you guys created. He called it, he coined it the Atlanta model. Um, and we didn't know it. So I used to say, yeah, it's been done a number of times around the city, around the country, we've done some of them. Until he said that there were 250. In fact, he said there were 254. Um, but there were a number of dynamics in Atlanta at that time that helped us. The Olympics were coming in 96. And the time I'm talking about was 94. So there was a certain amount of civic pride and engagement in preparing for the Olympics. I feel that energy in this room when you talk about transit. And no doubt I'm drawing a parallel here because Atlanta responded with the structure that we described, that I described a moment ago. And it won again and again and again. They got awards to do this thing that was so out of the box holistic transformation, treating, creating communities that were going to transform the trajectory of people in public housing. And remove that stigma. 
you have an opportunity in your vision for what you do in response to dollars inside of this um, bill in order to do something out of the box and nobody can do that better than you in formulating what you think is your uh, North Star statement. So I challenge you to do that. Uh, today, there is actually no public housing in Atlanta anymore. Atlanta had the highest per concentration of public housing per capita in any city in America. There is none. It's all gone. You either live in mixed income communities, the, the, the housing authority is serving more people today than it did back then. And it's had its own challenges. I don't want to create the impression that it's heaven and heaven. Heaven and heaven it has its own other issues. But that certainly is not one of them. And so, reimagining the ways that transit, a transit system can be a transformational community development agency and an anchor institution is what you have in front of you. And if you want to see what that looks like, think about what's happening in cities like Denver and Dallas, or even DC. You know, DC got was created, DC's metro system was created the same time that Marta in Atlanta was created. But DC managed in, until three years ago, it had 34 mixed use developments that were used to drive development around transit, while Atlanta had three. Now we have six, we've doubled, 100% growth. <laughs> six, why? Because Atlanta's system got stigmatized by race and class. And MARTA, which meant Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority, added in those, got labeled silently at the dinner table as moving Africans rapidly throughout Atlanta. And it has had to try to overcome that state. So, DC is an example. And think of Dallas. Everybody thinks about Dallas Airport. And it used to be that you had a 26 mile drive through farmlands to go to the Dallas Airport. And now, if you drive, take that drive, you drive into some wonderful neighborhoods, great schools, and so on. It was an economic development drive. So that's the kind of thing I want you to think about as the opportunity in front of you. And so much of the development that I know is happening in Atlanta and other parts of the country are the result of people waking up to the importance of transit and the ability to bring people closer to those places where they need to be. And I want to leave you with couple of lessons learned more often than not learned the hard way from community, the community development world. They say leadership matters, but nowadays collaborative leadership matters even more. Uh, strategic issues and challenges don't recognize these artificial boundaries we created. Oh, this is city X and that's city Y, or the county line is drawn here. Affordable housing is a challenge and it's a regional, regional challenge. So the ability to collaborate across jurisdictional boundaries is critical. A leader that understands that is therefore critical. We also have these arbitrary dates, elections, every four years or so. And if you're a leader and you think you have to do what you have to do within your term, you're probably making suboptimal decisions, if you're making short-term decisions to get back in office, and the solutions for these problems usually take quite a while to conceive and implement and don't get done in any one term. So there's a saying that I think the president of Coca-Cola is credited for saying, which is, you'll be amazed how much you can get done if you don't mind who gets the credit. And you need to think about the decisions you're making to be of such a transformational nature that they're going to span many election cycles. And more often than not, you're not in office when the fruits are really being born. But 
that's just the way it is. And then finally, um, I may have actually said my final one, but <laughs> what you're going to create, or what you need to create, is a big tent that everyone can see himself or herself in that tent and participate in the vision and the dream. That's how big things get done. I know I'm preaching to the choir from everything I've seen, but that is what the journey is. And I encourage you to think big, think boldly, and pursue that grand vision that will benefit generations later. And your name may not get mentioned, except in the most important places. So again, thank you for allowing me to stand before you.
Are you ready to build upon your existing services and to really elevate your position in this community? Are you ready to demonstrate how much of an economic engine you are to, the, to Hillsborough County? Are you ready to receive your share of the massive federal infrastructure funding that's coming your way? Are you? Are you? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Under the leadership of your CEO, Natalie LeGrand, I think you will be if you aren't already. But first, you need to know where you are to get where you're trying to go. That's a big part of why we're here today, to learn more about the state of heart. So Ms. LeGrand, the floor is yours. partnership. 
Um, you know, it's really about us all working collectively to do what's best for our community and ensuring that they have the best access to opportunities. And as Edward Perry said, that they're choosing to be places that people with choice would choose to be. And um, I'm looking forward to us continuing to do that. I have not lost sight of the fact that in order for us to do those things, we need to have a team that is focused on achieving our goals. And I'm fortunate today to have members of the leadership team, both on the administrative side as well as our union leadership. So if our union leadership would stand, please, let's uh, recognize them. It's more than just the stats and the stats. 
You know, we talk about coming out of the pandemic and understanding where we were before and where we are now, right? So if you look at this chart here, 2018, FY18, we were looking pretty good. Um, our numbers were going up by FY19, we're making gains. And then we have the first, I'd say, three quarters of the year of being hit by COVID. And then the last year was a full blown COVID year. You see how our numbers are dipping down, right? But even with that, we were focused on our on-time performance, recognizing that the community, those who still have to travel via transit, need to be able to rely on our service during the pandemic, and we were able to make those improvements. So you see here that we've made increases over FY18 and 19, when we had higher numbers, to FY21, where we're now hitting in the 80s consistently. The industry standard for on-time performance is 77%. The heart goal is 85%. And Stephen feels very, he sends me an email every morning about where we are, and he is definitely determined to get us to that 85%. I have told Stephen that I need 90%, but officially 85%. He knows. You've heard I'm a taskmaster, so it's not just me. But when we talk about our on-time performance, and we think about the type of service that we're providing. This chart is less about the specific name of the route, it's more about the concentration of the level of service we're providing. The majority of our routes, our frequency is every 60 minutes. Right, so we are providing better on-time performance at 82%, but the vast majority of our customers have to wait an hour for every route to come, for every bus to come. We have to do more. We have to provide more. And this level of service is included in our budget that was $168 million, which was approved in September of this year. So our budget allows us to provide this level of service. There are some modest improvements in our budget, but not much. Not much to make these 60 minute headways go to 30 minute headways, which would then be recognized as having pretty decent service. So when we talk about the infrastructure bill and doing more with what we have, this is an area of focus for us, to really think about how we can find funding to improve our frequencies, to put more routes out there. But in order to do that, we have to buy more buses, hire more operators, get them to stay, to work, and be a part of our internal community. The investment in local bus service is not just something that hard and those in the transit recognized as being important. This is a study that was commissioned by the Tampa Bay Partnership. And they recognize that investing in local bus service has a 29% impact on our economic vitality in the metro area, in the Tampa Bay area. So it's not just us who are in the business of providing public mobility. It's also those who, you know, were unaware. I talked to the staff who worked on this project and they basically said, you know, we were unaware that these were going to be the results when the University of Michigan conducted the study or the analysis for them. So it's the right thing to do. It's the right business case. But again, we need dollars so that we can order and have more buses, hire more bus operators to provide the service that we need to go from those 60-minute frequencies to getting into the 15 and 20. Look how small. We have three routes that have 15-minute frequencies. Right? Two with 20. And so many with over 60. So how do we get there? We get there through focusing on the customer experience and working with the partners that I mentioned. In order to have more buses and be able to accommodate those buses so that they can get out to the community, we have to have a new heavy maintenance facility. One that can accommodate more vehicles. We need to be able to transition our fleet from a diesel and CNG fleet to an electric fleet so that we're being good stewards of our environment and being focused on our climate action plan. I see my friend Whit sitting in the audience. Are you proud of me saying this? Okay. <laughs> so those are the things that we have to do. But it takes, again, our partners to help us to build a new facility so that we can now start to make the advancements. You know, some of these things aren't sexy and shiny. And we do have shiny things on our list of priorities, but some of the nut and bolt work that we have to do is really getting more buses out there into the community, 
restructuring our route so it's easy to go from downtown to the mall without it taking three times longer in a bus than it does in a car. Those are the things that we need to focus on, but we can't do that without a new facility. We worked internally as a team to really have a conversation about what does it look like for our future, recognizing where we are today and where do we need to go in order to accomplish you know, these, these goals that may seem super small. But what does it take to do that? We had a series of charrettes, many of the folks in the room participated. And what we came up with collaboratively is a new vision for heart. And the vision is here on the screen, and I'll read it for you. To be the highest customer-ranked mobility provider in the Tampa Bay region. And why are we focused on being the highest customer-ranked? Because if our customers internally and externally rank us high for providing service, higher than any other mode, then we know we're doing our job because we are doing the work of our community. And that's what we're striving to do moving forward. Not that we weren't focused on the customer, we were. But now we are laser firm focused on how do we improve their experience? How do we provide the resources that are needed so that we can have better coverage of this vast county, which we all know is very vast, so that we can support our employees so they have a great place to work and that they're paid a living wage, one that they are comfortable with and they can still you know, live a nice work-life balance some of you guys are like, really? We get a work like that too. <laughs> um, you know, so that we can definitely show the community that we're here to support them and we recognize what that takes and how to get there. So I'll close today and say this is just the beginning. The state of is very bright. We're in a great space and we're looking forward to making big things happen. And I'm fortunate to work with the best people that the industry can provide to allow us to get there. So thank you so much for your time today. Let's give our leader another round of applause. anyone on the panel, um, please ask them now. If not, we will see you guys soon on the bus. <laughs>